Hi there. We are so glad you joined us today for this message. We hope you enjoy it. Kick back, learn about Jesus, and be blessed. Talk to you soon. The prisoner goes free. Thank you for writing it properly for other than on my paper. <clears throat> the uh, We'll see you kids. Have fun back there. Don't make too much noise. There's a lot of folks out today. Man, I know the Rangers are playing this afternoon, and there's uh, the Stars, and uh, Rodeo's still going, and so there's a lot of stuff going on, and uh, everybody chose that instead of this, so all the people I was going to preach to didn't show up today, once again, <clears throat> but uh there was a there the church council was having a meeting right and uh, so the guys got together and they were putting together a, a package for the pastor for the next year uh, to uh for his finances and whatnot and they have to vote on it and everything so they got this all together and they were talking about it and everything and then uh the uh they drew straws to see who was going to be the one to go talk to the pastor and uh so one of the elders went up and said, Hey, Pastor, I'm I'm sorry. We're not going to be able to give you a raise this year. And he said, Oh, man, I'm just a poor pastor. And he said, Yeah, we talked about that. We all hear you every Sunday. <clears throat> we all hear you every Sunday. So... uh as we get into this, this there's a lot of neat things uh, as we've been studying in uh, the Old Testament and the New Testament, Old Testament on Wednesday, New Testament uh, on Sunday, and with stuff we've talked about. It's so amazing to me to see what God does is Wednesday night and then uh, through the men's meeting, through Thursday night men's meeting, through Saturday morning, and all the things that happened uh just pour into me and then when I get to come up here a lot of it all mixes together and comes out uh, as a as like a scarlet thread that is in this word in this book and that I love finding and it just excites me so <clears throat> we're going to read uh, here in Matthew 27 from verse 11 down to verse 26 and uh, let's start with verse 11. Meanwhile, Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? You have said so, Jesus replied. Then he was accused by the chief priest and the elders, and he gave no answer when they accused him. Then Pilate asked, Do you not hear the testimony they bring against you? But Jesus made no reply. Not even a single, not even to a single charge. And to the amazement of the governor. Now, it was the governor's custom at the festival to release a prisoner chosen by the crowd. At that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. So when the crowd had gathered, Pilate asked them, which one do you want me to release to you? Jesus Barabbas, Jesus Barabbas or Jesus who is called the Messiah? For he knew it was out of self-interest that they handed Jesus over to him. While Pilate was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent him a message. Don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. Which of the two do you want me to release to you? Asked the governor. Barabbas, they answered. 
What shall I do then with Jesus who is called the Messiah? Pilate asked. And they answered, Crucify Him. Why? The crime has... What crime has He committed? Asked Pilate. But they shouted all the louder, Crucify Him. While Pilate saw... When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting, he took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It is your responsibility. And all the people answered, his blood is on us and on our children. Then he released Barabbas to them. And he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for this letter that you have sent to us, Lord. Thank you for the grace that you give us in our life, Lord. We just thank you for this day and for this small church, Lord, that that you have blessed us with this place of refuge that we can go and get out of the world. We just ask that you bless these proceedings. Let your Holy Spirit come and reign in this place. In Jesus' name we ask. Amen. So, this is a time that uh, often is the push between two things uh, in this story. It's often that the one that's just pushed through and read over and not really discussed a whole lot. Uh, and it's written in several different places. In uh, Isaiah, uh, verse 53, or chapter 53, verse 7, which I didn't give to you, it says, He was opposed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was like a lamb sent to the slaughter, as a sheep before the shearer is silent. He did not open his mouth. No, that's the first thing that we do whenever we come and we're afflicted. We want to stand up for ourselves. We're taught that. Uh, when I was a young man, I came home one time from school and uh, a girl had beat me up. And my dad uh, said, why did you let a girl beat you up? And he said, you know, son, defend yourself. Don't ever come home and let me hear that a girl beat you up. I'll beat you up. And I thought, you know, it was funny to me because she wanted me to be her boyfriend. And I didn't want to be her boyfriend. And when I said, no, I don't want to be your boyfriend, she started scratching me and punching me and I just stood there and took it, okay? So, in that sense, it was a funny story when I told my dad what had happened. But he had also taught me to defend myself. And we do that. Way too much. But we shouldn't, right? Because what happens when you start to defend yourself? You can't ever stop. There's no end to it. Because you can't offend yourself uh, efficiently to to people, to man. They've already decided who and what you are and who and what they're going to do to you. You can't fight that. Only God can fight that. Now, is anybody here going going to not stand up for themselves? No. We'll all stand up for ourselves because you can't resist. Your flesh can't resist that. But Jesus did. Peter later tells us that it would be worthy of us to be able to do this for ourselves. To let God do it for us. And in verse 11 it says, Meanwhile he stood before the governor and he asked him, Are you the king? You have said so. Man, You have said so. No other words. But he gets mad and he says, but these guys that have accused you, don't you hear what they're saying about you? They're bringing these testimonies against you. 
In Psalms chapter 18, verse 1 through 3, Psalms 18. I love you, Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. My God is my rock, in whom I take refuge. My shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I called to the Lord, who is worthy of praise, and I have been saved from my enemies. See, there's a promise to us that we have to we have to remember to voice, right? My horn of salvation. What does the horn speak of? The horn speaks of power. That's what that means. A powerful salvation. My shield. We all know what a shield is. A refuge. The place you can go where you feel safe. Right? He is our protector. He is the one that stands up for us. What did Jesus end? What is he doing now, right now, today? He's ever interceding for us, each and every one of us, and at the same time. It's it's amazing to think that any sin that you've ever committed has already been dealt with when you come under Jesus Christ. There's nothing you'll stand for him, stand before him, and have to be have to answer for. And when we say that, we also know that you might have something that you are holding back that you think, when I get up there, I'm going to have to answer for this. There's no way that I'm going to be forgiven for that. That is not true. He covered it all. He died for all your sins, all your past ancestors' sins and all your grandchildren and great-grandchildren's sins. Amen? So in verse 13 and 14, it says, Now uh, it was a custom for this festival to release a prisoner chose by the crowd. And at that time, they had a well-known prisoner whose name was Jesus Barabbas. And when you look in the history and you talk about this man, the history of this man, uh, he was like, a, you could attest him to Ted Bundy. Uh, in John, it says that he was a murderer. He incited violence in the city. And uh, he uh, was a rapist. He was just a crazy man, right? So Pilate's doing this, and he's setting this up. I'll take this one, right? Because there's no way they're going to want to take this guy out amongst them again. There's no way. They're going to pick this this other man. What, what would you think, right? That's what he's thinking while he does this. This savage of a man will put him up there to be released. Now, does this have any kind of ex- examples or, or uh, mean anything to any anybody at all? Taking a prisoner and freeing him? Huh? Yeah, there's presidential parties. This is a once a year time thing at this festival, which is Yom Kippur, uh, the uh, Passover, while this is going on. Okay. Pause there. We'll get into that in a minute. In John chapter 19, verse 10 through 12. says, Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Do you not realize I have the power neither to free or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jewish leaders kept shouting, 
If you let this man go, you are no friend to Caesar. Man, playing it on him, right? <clears throat> Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. These guys hated Caesar. I mean, they were so against the Roman government and the Roman rule, but unless it's going to be on their side, unless it's going to achieve the gold that they want, right? So, and these are the people, these are the men that are supposed to be the ones who are taking care of Israel, mining the flock, taking care of God's people. It, how corrupt it has gotten from Leviticus, from the first, when it was started with Aaron. And many of you who've studied that with us know. But they're using this against him, saying, look, man, you can't even be, you can't do, he's, he's backed in a corner, completely backed in a corner. He has no way to make a choice other than to do exactly what they say. Plus, Pilate had a history, and this was like the, his going to be his third strike, and he was going to be out. Uh, he had messed up before. He was, he thought when he, when he came in as governor, he rode in, he had banners, and they all had eagles on them. And he rode right into the temple grounds, and the, the elders came, and, and they came into the temple's grounds, and they said, no, you can't bring those idols in here. And he, he corralled them all up, and he said, okay, we're going to slaughter them all. We're going we're gonna to show who's boss here now. We're going to make an example of them. They took their robes off and said, go ahead. Kill us all. Cut our heads off. There'll be 10,000 more. Then we'll just, they'll just keep showing up, keep showing up, because you're going against our God. So he, was, he had a problem there, so he went ahead and let them go. Oh, they're all going to just let me kill them? Dang, that's never going to stop. And so he backed off, let him go. Then he, he built an aqueduct for him, and he went thinking he was really smart, but he was really stupid. Went to build this magnificent waterway to bring water to them, but he where did he get the money? He went into the temple and took some of the temple funds to fund this thing. And that made him mad. Yeah, you're doing something for us, but you're taking our money to do it. Uh, when the government does that now, where do we go? Oh, darn. My taxes were really high this year. What are they doing with it? Well, they're trying to put stuff in the water so your teeth will be better, right? No. But we don't stand up for stuff like that anymore. They did. They did back then. We just kind of go, well, that's the way it is. I guess they have a reason for everything they do. Yeah. So uh, in this, in, in Matthew, it says Jesus Barabbas. So, and, and it doesn't say that in any other, but if you go back three or four centuries, back to the old, old manuscripts, it says Jesus Barabbas. Why is that? Jesus was a uh, a common name, a common first name. Uh, Barabbas. Does anybody know what that means? Son of the Father. Jesus Barabbas. Or he says, Jesus. Who is called the Messiah? Jesus. Yeshua Messiah or Yeshua Barabbas. And then while he was sitting there, his wife comes and gives a message. Now, it says that uh, she sent a message, sent this message to him. Don't have anything to do with this innocent man, for I have suffered a great deal today in dreams because of him. Um, and, and we know that Daniel, uh, had, had some dreams and we know about dreams, right? If Mandy was here, she would, she likes dreams and thinking about that. Do you? 
also seems to be an artist thing, right? We have a lot of artists in here in this church, but it, it kind of seems to be, that, you know, reading dreams. What does that mean? You know, interpreting dreams. Uh, and she had a dream. Now, what did she see? There's different things that have been written. Uh, different scholars have written different things over the years. So what they were thinking is why it tormented her so much was that she saw what was going to happen when she said she suffered many things. So she could have seen exactly what was happening to Jesus or she could have seen exactly what was going to happen to the people who did this to Jesus. Uh, either or. That's something that we, we see now when we read the books uh, and we go through, we see it was a horrific, horrible thing. And the Jewish people suffered for it. Pilate suffered for it. Uh, man, and my wife comes and tells me stuff quite often. Don't do this. It steers me. That's why we have uh, others. That's why God puts us together. Is to steer one another. Sometimes it's hard to listen, man. As a man, it's hard to listen. I get stubborn. But, uh, and then God slows me down. And it's usually like it was this last week. Just sick until you can't go anymore. Uh, so in verse 18, it's for he knew, uh, that it was out of self-interest that they handed Jesus over to him. So Pilate already knew these guys are doing something that's wrong. Don't seem like this man did anything wrong. They're trying to pull one over on me because of what they're telling me that you're, you're against Caesar if you let this man live because he says he's a king. So they're trying to manipulate him to a place, right? And he's getting there. He's getting there fast. And his wife comes with a message to tell him, don't do this. Now, it says that she sent him the message, but uh, pretty much most of the things that I've read, it was something that was pronounced either by a messenger or her. If you watch The Passion, it's her. She comes and whispers in his ear. No, that's not completely correct. That's Hollywood correct, which we can, you know, that target's a lot bigger than, you know, that target. <clears throat> we want to be sharp on this. We want to know what we're talking about, right? So the way that I read it, it was pronounced as a message, not just for Pilate, but for everyone who was there listening. And in that case, it was a warning out of a woman's heart that God gave her a dream and saw this. Now, how many times have we seen so far where there was a way out? There was a way to stop this. There was something put in, in a, a way that Judas, he called him friend. He seated him at the table. All the things we can flash back to we've seen so far. There was so many ways that it could have stopped with Judas. But it didn't. Here again, here's a warning. Uh, from, from the download of the dream, there's a warning to it. You guys don't do this. Don't have anything to do with this. We know from history that Pilate, not too many years after this, found, he, you know, he got placed way out into nowhere and was forgotten about. Came to his demise. Didn't live for a long time. Didn't have a happy life. All the men, they say, uh, well, they're all dead now. But the reason why they did this was out of envy, self-interest, and jealousy. So, I was thinking about this. Do you know any time you're crucified? It's because of envy, self-interest, or jealousy. Basically, envy encompasses all those words. 
So when you crucify someone else, it's because of envy. What was he taking away from them? He's taking away the way they make money, their business, the people attesting to them, coming to them for all the answers. He's taking away their livelihood, right? Everything that he is threatens them. Let me tell you today, everything that Jesus is should not threaten you. It threatens you when you're out in the world. It should be a threat to you. Most people who are very angry, very, very angry, very violent about I will not and I don't believe are the ones that are the closest to believing. They're actually, they're actually seeking something. Why am I really here? What is the big picture? What is going to happen after this? If anything. And, I, and I've said lots of times, it takes a lot more faith to not believe in, than it does to believe. If you live your life and you think all there is after this is darkness, man, that takes a lot of faith. Because what if it's not? Where uh, the Indians and all their beliefs and everything you got to, and reincarnation and coming around, and each time you get better and better and more spiritual and more better, and then you become a Kachina, one of the gods on the wall there. As you life progresses and first time you're really bad at it and then you get better and better and more spiritual and spiritual. But if you just go and try to live like Jesus, you bypass all that. But that threatens people who believe that. That threatens them. Because it's the base of their belief. We live by the things we can see and taste. And the Lord wants us to believe in the things that we can't see, that we can't taste. <clears throat> Allow His Spirit to wash us. So, in uh, verse 19 and 20 here, 19, in uh, while He's sitting there, His wife comes with this message, but the chief priests and the elders persuade the crowd to ask for Barabbas and to have Jesus executed. How many times have you been in a spot in your life when, when uh, you are looking at walking in this direction, you are looking or, or just remember when you were going to give your life to the Lord or were you interested in God or you were looking at those kinds of things, the whole crowd around you is pulling you away, telling you, no, Barabbas, no, take Take this path. Don't go that way. Don't do that thing. Why do you not want to be our friend anymore? Well, I'm not, doesn't mean I'm not your, I have a lot of friends that don't come to church. You, we all do. We have lots of friends that don't come to church. They're still our friends. Even though sometimes it's drastic when you're out on the street and you're doing drugs and you're messing around and doing all that kind of stuff and you come out of that, there's a lot of people you have to leave behind. You hope to see them again, right? When you do see them again and you look different, you look different. There's something about you. Well, that's the Spirit of God. I want some. I want that peace. I want that, that what, I want what you have. That opens the door. That's how God does that. Not by what we do. So, they decide to release this guy. And 22 is something we need to all think about. This is a question that from that point was asked by an ungodly man who realized that he was in the wrong spot, doing the wrong thing, couldn't get out of it, saw no way out was warned by his wife, still did not heed that. He asked this question in verse 22. What shall I do then with Jesus, who is called the Messiah? That's a question for us today. What shall I do then with this Jesus called Messiah? And I believe, I believe with everything that I am, Everything, every fiber of my being, that that is what you're going to be asked. 
not, you know, come on in all the things that you hear about how it's going to be in heaven. I believe it's going to be, what did you do with what I gave you? And what did God give us? His Son. What did He give us? The Comforter, the Spirit. What did He give us? A beautiful love letter to us. An alternative. A different way of thinking. Man, once your mind starts to think this way, you can, it just, ch- it changes everything. It changes everything about you. So ask that question to yourselves today. What do I do with this Christ? This Jesus Christ. In Acts chapter 3, verse 13 through 16. The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. The God of our fathers. And this is when Paul, or Peter, is strong on it. He's preaching. Has glorified His servant Jesus. You handed over to be killed. And disowned Him before Pilate. Though He had decided to let Him go. You disowned the Holy and Righteous One and asked that the murderer be released to you. You killed the author of life, but God raised him from the dead. We are witnesses of this. By faith in the name of Jesus, this man whom you see and know was made strong. It is Jesus' name and the faith that comes through Him that has completely healed Him, as you can see. This is the point where they see the beggar and he asks, he's asking for money. And they say, "What I don't, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have, I will give you. And they take His hand. He raises up. Once again, just telling the message that they already know. Letting them know that His blood is on you. His blood is on you. In verse 23, it says, What crime has He committed? But they shouted even louder, Crucify Him! Crucify Him! When Pilate saw that he was getting nowhere, but that instead an uproar was starting. He took water, washed his hands in front of the crowd. I am innocent of this man's blood, he said. It's your responsibility. In Deuteronomy, this is what he's doing. Uh, uh, In Deuteronomy chapter 21, verse 1 through 9, this is what Pilate's doing. If someone is found slain, lying in a field in the land of the Lord, your God is given to you to possess, and it is not known who the killer was. So you find somebody laying out in a field, somebody's killed him, but you don't know who it was, right? Your elders and judges shall go out uh, measure the distance from the body to the neighboring, neighboring towns. Then the elders of the town nearest the body shall take a heifer has never been worked and has never been, uh, never worn a yoke and lead it down to the valley that has not been plowed or planted where there is a Flowing stream. Is this, does this seem like it's a picture that God's already seen as He's saying how to do this? I've already seen how this is going to go. Well, there's a flowing stream in the valley that hasn't been plowed or, or planted. There in the valley, they are to break the, the heifer's neck. Break the heifer's neck. The Levitical priest should step forward 
For the Lord your God has chosen them to minister and to pronounce blessings in the name of the Lord and to decide all cases of disputes and assaults. And then all the elders of the town nearest to the body shall be wa- shall wash their hands over the heifers whose neck was broken in the valley, and they shall declare, Our hands did not shed this blood, nor did our eyes see it done, except the aton- this atonement for the people of Israel, whom you have redeemed, Lord, and do not hold your people guilty for the blood of a innocent person, then the bloodshed will be atoned for and you will have purged from yourselves the guilt of the shedding of innocent blood since you have done what is right in the eyes of the Lord. So he's doing this whole ceremony, which is a lot of stuff to read to you. And and if you've never read that before, it might not make a sense, but he's doing that in the same sense. He's not... He's washing his hands of the innocent blood. Uh, <clears throat> there are so many things that say how innocent Christ was. Not only just that that's the way it had to be, but that's the way it had to be. Amen? Alright, so I'm going to move on here to... to uh, we're going to end up being done early today. And that's mainly because Bobby's not here. Uh, <clears throat> and you all know what that means, right? <clears throat> all the people answered him, verse 25, Matthew 27. His blood will be on us and our children. His blood will be on us. And our children. Have you seen that? Did you see that? They were always in captivity. Always, always having trouble. And their blood's always been on their hands, right? They, they, the, uh, the Jewish people have struggled. Struggled and struggled and struggled. And that blood's always been on their hands. In, uh, then he released Barabbas to them. But he had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. In the in the flogging of someone was something that didn't necessarily need to be done before they were crucified. But uh, the way that they did it, on you see it on the Passion and things like that. It's not really correct to the way that they did that type of thing. They would actually uh, hang them from their arms, from their wrists, and whip them with the shards and glass and stone and everything tied in the whip, which would be uh, rip the skin. So sometimes organs and skin would be gone and bones would be showing and those things. And it is drastic, but it's a, it's where they cannot move to get away. Or wiggle around even. Then, when the lashes were, was decided were done, they would let them down, still tied to the pole, let them down. And if they were still alive, then that was the, that was their punishment. And you go off and hopefully you'll heal or you'll just die. He was still alive. That's the only reason why he was crucified. But his blood was poured out there in the city. His blood was poured out in the city. And then his body was taken outside like we've been reading in Leviticus and Exodus. Taken out of the camp and given to God. All right. There's, there's so many cool things that you see in Acts chapter 5, verse 27 through 30. The apostles were about were brought in the and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders 
not to teach in this name. He said, yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teachings and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. So all they were doing was reminding them, you guys killed this guy. You guys are the ones that did it. And so that testimony that they were spreading around Jerusalem was about what they did wrong. Now, how do you, how do you deal with that? How does a normal person deal with that when you've done something wrong? And you have someone that's constantly t- reminding you and telling you you've done something wrong. Man, that's the world. The world looks at Christians that way because we major on sin. We major on reminding people that you don't, it, you can't do it by yourself. But there's a reason why we're that way. It's because we know how to be saved from our sin. It's not scary to us. But people in the world don't know how to be saved from the things that they've done. So when you're reminded, it just brings all those feelings back. Shame. I did that. I did that. I'm going to have to answer for that. One day I'm going to just keep tossing that ball down the road. And then pretty soon I'm going to... No, this Jesus gives forgiveness for sin. And he. where does it say it goes? It's far is from the east, is from the west. That's crazy. Now, here's somebody who made all this stuff, put it all together. When you start going east, do you ever get west? No, you just keep going east. If you go west, you just keep going west. You can't ever... As far as from the east, is from the west. Forgotten. It's gone. Amen. Amen. That only excites me, I know. <clears throat> we gave you strict orders, and Peter and the other apostles replied, we must obey God rather than human beings. I, I, I've been thinking about that a lot lately. And I'm trying to figure out where I can say that at. What official public building can I go to and say, I would rather, I must obey God, not human beings. But then he says, give to Caesar what is Caesar's, so it's not the tax guy. Gosh, it's not the IRS. The God of your ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on the cross. Cursed is the one who is hung on a tree. We talked about Judas knew that he had betrayed innocent blood and he did the closest thing he could do, which was hang himself by the neck. Because you can't crucify yourself. I mean, you can hammer that one in, but you can't do that one. You may get your feet, but I, you know what? I don't think, I don't think any human being could drive a nail between in their skin. Maybe there's some out there. I don't know. Lord bless them. So this whole passage that we're reading here is there's something I want to show you in here that that, that God's always showing us more, right? Here's the more for this. There's a picture. And this is from the Passion. You have Jesus and you have Barabbas both chained, Jesus being beaten up beforehand. Because at this time, not all Gospels, Matthew doesn't say that, but he went to to Caiaphas. He's gone to Pilate. Pilate said, oh, you've been over. You, you're from, from over there. You're a Galilean, so you send him to Herod. And then he comes back to Pilate because Pilate's the only one that can, can actually pull this off being the Roman governor. He's the only one that can actually condemn him to the cross. It's the way God wanted it to be. But he has been mocked and beaten and and his beard pulled out. Man, every once in a while, my wife will try to get my attention and just grab one. But I mean, that's, that's painful. Or she'll grab my horns. 
and pull them out. <clears throat> so you have these two standing there, and he's asking this question. Which one would you have? Now, we talked about the name before. Jesus Barabbas. Jesus, Son of the Father. Or Jesus, Son of the Father. Now, it's crazy because you can search these words out for yourself and you can prove it out for yourself. But you don't hear it a lot from 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 the podium from from people preaching this. So, a lot of people don't know uh, these things that intertwine. But we're studying the Old Testament and the New Testament because they talk to each other. It's a line there. There's a, there's patterns. So you have two men with the same name. Completely opposite. One is the worst criminal you can think of. Uh, reading uh, some things that Matthew Henry wrote about him. Ted Bundy kind of stuff. Uh, if I was to come with someone who we would know. Uh, and Jesus, the innocent blood. The innocent one. Two completely opposites. So we're going to go to Leviticus chapter 16, which we're not there yet in our study. So this is a, this is a little bit I've got to reveal here for our Wednesday night study. From verse 3 to 10. <clears throat> this is how Aaron is to enter the most holy place. Aaron being the high priest, the most holy place being the, the, uh, the tent of meetings, the tabernacle. He must first bring a young bull for a sin offering and a ram for a burn offering. Right, Vicky? Yes. <clears throat> and he is to put on his uh, scarf, sacred linen, his tunic, uh, with his linen undergarments next to his body. And he is to tie the linen sash around him and put on the linen turban. Uh, these are sacred garments so that he, uh, so he must bathe himself with water before he puts them on. For the Israelite community, he is to take two male goats for a sin offering and a ram for a burnt offering. So this is for the Israelite community. He used to take two male goats. Now more into this as you go further, the two male goats need to be identical or closely similar. It's crazy. It's so God. For the commun Israelite community, uh, the two male goats for a sin offering and a burnt offering. Aaron is to offer the bull for his own sin, which we read that, that's for the sin of the priest. Okay. Uh, offering to make an atonement for himself and his household. And he is to take the, the two goats and present them before the Lord at the entrance of the tent of meetings. He is to cast lots for the two goats, one lot for the Lord, and the other lot for the scapegoat. So, he would have a, a little canister with the lots in there. He would shake it, take one out, and put one on this goat, and the other one on this goat. Now, one is going to be the sacrifice to the Lord, for the community of Israel, and the other one is going to be the scapegoat that is let go off into the wilderness. Crazy, but beautiful, right? Okay. I waited till the end to tell you all this. I waited till the end to get excited about this. All right, so uh, 
Aaron shall bring the goat whole, uh, lots, fall unto the Lord. Uh, that will be the sin offering. Uh, but the goat chosen by the lots as a scapegoat shall present alive before the Lord to be used for making atonement by sending it into the wilderness as a scapegoat. So go back to that picture, if you would. So here you have the governor, Gubna. This is Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. Now, we've seen as, as it went Passover in the morning, about noontime now, that this happens. You have two men, same name, completely different people. Completely different people. One is going to be the sacrifice for the sins of the entire world. And the other one's the scapegoat, going to get released out into the wilderness. You see the similarities there? It's what a beautiful picture. Now I want to tell you guys, every one of us is a bar abbas. Now there is people around that say, you know, I I feel like Jesus is telling me something. I feel like He's giving me something. I feel like He's pulling on me for something. He's, he's, He's telling you that you don't have to be the criminal, the murderer. Here, There is a way, and He did it. We all come to Him as a criminal, as a thief, as a murderer. In we come into a place where we are Bar Abbas, son of father. And with the exchange that Jesus made and the sacrifice, the atonement that he made, we can become sons of the father. No longer a criminal, but right with God. I just want you to know today that there is absolutely no sin that you could ever do that is not covered by accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior. I know a man who wrote a book. He said, you don't have to be sick anymore. He says, you don't have to be Scared anymore. You don't have to have anxiety anymore. He has medicine for us in His Word. Amen? So today as we go forward from this moment, you see what He had did. The, the man that nobody wanted around, He died for. That man's sins were covered if he accepted Him or not. It's there for us. We just have to pick it up and run and don't look back. By oppression and judgment, He was taken away. Yet that generation protested. And he, Jesus, was cut off from the land of the living for the transgressions of the people so that they would not be punished, but to be made righteous before the Lord. I just want to say that if anybody needs prayer for anything, come up. <clears throat> if you uh, have an ailment, you have anything, give it to the Lord. Pray for your brothers and sisters. It doesn't have to be me. You can do it. 
Pray for the ones who you don't see here today. That they safely return. Know that every moment that we have is is critical. It's a critical point. It's a point where we need to make a decision that will affect not only us, but the people around us. One of the things that changed in my life when I started to change was the people around me. It's hard to see, but man, when you're not running a huge damage path in people's lives anymore, they don't mind being around you. Remember, we need to stay in His Word so that we can give an answer for the hope that we have. Father, I just thank You for this day. I thank You for the life that You have breathed into us, Lord. I thank You for Your Spirit that leads us. I thank You for one more day, Lord. One more day. Show us what You would have us do and where You would have us go. Allow us to understand how we can make our lives pleasing to You, Lord. And Father, we thank You for all the gifts that You give us, meaning the people in our lives. We thank You for Jesus. Lord, help us to be more like Your Son. In Jesus of Nazareth's name, I ask these things. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you for joining us today. We hope you were blessed. If you have any questions, please give us a call, 682-327-7082. We are at 7955 Reed Road in Azle, Texas. Y'all have a good day now, you hear?